Yes, um, Commissioner Deutsch is absent. Commissioner Eventov? Here. Chair Faulkner? Here. Commissioner Lecters is absent. Vice Chair Pastorian? Here. Commissioner Steed? Here. And Commissioner Wilson? Here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Commission Secretary, are there any public comments on non-agenda items? We do not have any for non-agenda. All right, thank you so much. Now we'll move on to the consent calendar. Uh, can I get a motion to approve uh, the minutes of January 11, 2024? Motion. I'll second. I have a uh, motion by Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Pastorian, and a second by Commissioner Steed. I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Eventov? Aye. Chair Faulkner? Aye. Vice Chair Pastorian? Aye. Commissioner Steed? Aye. And Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be recognizing Black History Month uh, and a proclamation as well. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to uh, sharing this great night with you tonight. Uh, uh, can I get a staff report, Director? Yes, Chair Faulkner. Um, I'll just make a very brief staff report, and mm -hmm. then we'll go ahead and play our video. So this is the first meeting under the new process, um, and I think it is, um, it's, it's worth kind of repeating um, that um, the... The proclamations um, will continue to be provided at the Ready Commission throughout this entire year. Mm -hmm. The process has been changed um, so that the invitations now do not just go out to the students. Um, they are actually going out to the students as well as other groups in the community. And um, community me all community members are welcome to attend. All community members are welcome to request a proclamation. If they request a proclamation prior to the meeting, that proclamation with their, their, their club's name, their organization's name, um, will be available here at the meeting. And in the alternative, we can always mail one to them as well. Um, and so we would continue to encourage um, the, the school district and the students of all of the clubs to continue to participate and to continue to go ahead and um, provide public comments. I know that was something, that while they were an active program, part of the program last year, um, they were built into the city's program. This year, they, they're not necessarily built into the city's program, but they can provide the exact same comments under public comments along with everybody else that is here to support Black History Month. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're inclusive of everybody. Um, with that, um, Chair Faulkner, um, actually, this go around, we were able to find a video that you might find directly relevant. So, uh, <laughs> Chris, if you want to go ahead and play the video. It's an honor to commemorate Black History Month here at the Department of Veterans Affairs. My lead. Each February, since Black History Month was established 98 years ago, the nation takes this opportunity to celebrate the numerous achievements Black Americans tribute to men and women who sacrificed and lived to all the promise of equality and freedom. And this year's theme, African Americans and the Arts, shines a light on the artists whose music, literature, poetry, and profile contributes to the rich tapestry of our nation's history, providing a platform from which every story can be told and every voice can be listened. Masterful musicians like Billy Holiday, Nina Simone, and Miles Davis. The literary giants like Langston Hughes, Dorian L. Hirschman, and Toni Morrison. Their works lay bare the harsh realities of American past. Racism, inequality, discrimination. Serving as a powerful lens through which to understand and appreciate the black experience while advocating for the rights to which Every American is entitled. Some of the most powerful depictions in art on race relations in America have been produced by black vets whose narrative storytelling on canvas has left an indelible mark on American culture. Vets like Corporal Horace Dixon, who served in the all black 369th Infantry Regiment, 
better known as the Harlem Hellfighters during World War I. Until a German sniper's bullet paralyzed his right arm during the Meuse Argonne offensive. He became one of the most respected and influential artists of the 20th century. Honorably discharged in 1919, he overcame his physical disability, for which he received a VA pension of $22.50 at the time. He taught himself to paint, stating that war had supplied him with inspiration and energy. That's like Jacob Lawrence, whose service in the Coast Guard would become part of a larger narrative of broader struggle for equality within the armed forces. When Lawrence was drafted into the Coast Guard during World War II, he was an established artist, well known for his 60 panel set of paintings called the Migration Series, which told the story of black Americans moving from the rural south to the urban north during World War I. The opportunities available to him was severely limited due to racial segregation in Dayton. Initially assigned as a steward's mate, the only job available to black at that time, he would be transferred to the sea class, the Navy's first ship with a fully integrated crew, and served as a combat artist, documenting the war efforts in Italy, England, Egypt, and India. A position that allowed his artistic ability and immense talents to flourish faithfully recorded the courage and gallantry of his battle brothers and arms, the master of war. Following his discharge, Petty Officer Third Class Lawrence would go on to paint the war field, which contrasts the experience of white and black sailors supporting each other in battle, with the racism black Americans faced in the military and back at home. And then there's Medal of Honor recipient and Vietnam veteran Colonel Paris Hayes, who had the courage to put the needs of his fellow soldiers and of this nation before himself during combat operations in Vietnam in 1962. Then Captain Paris Hayes, one of the nation's first black special forces officers, braved intense enemy fire at least four different times without hesitation to save his men. While severely injured himself, and he saved every last one of them. His actions epitomize that high, precious ideal of serving, of giving everything one has to a noble cause greater than oneself. And his service didn't end after he took off uniform because Colonel Davis understands better than most that serving and helping others creates a better world. Following his 25-year military career, Colonel Davis published the local newspaper for 30 years focused on civil rights issues within his local black community. This newspaper wasn't merely a medium for news. It was a platform created so that black Americans could understand the importance of sharing and telling their stories in their own way. And that newspaper allowed Colonel Davis to be part of not just their stories, but also their history. You know, during commemoration like this, we always talk about great people, as I've just said. I'm sure their stories are woven into the broader narratives of American history. But history is not just a collection of names and facts. It's not enough to just remember their names and their stories. When we remember the stories of Corporal Pickett, Petty Officer Third Class Lawrence, and Colonel Davis, we inherit the wisdom embedded in their contributions to the nation that remind us of the enormous cost of the freedom we enjoy today, born of their sacrifice. Remembering the sacrifices of these black vets and millions of others reminds us of their belief in the idea and the promise found in the Constitution and of their courage, resilience, and unwavering commitment to the principles of that document, equality. Remembering their stories reminds us that they fought to dismantle systemic barriers of racism, but then too often returned home from those fights only to have to confront barriers all over again. So what we at VA have to fight for is once and for all 
breaking down those barriers and ensuring every veteran gets the care and benefits they receive. And refusing to accept decisions that in the past resulted in inequity and unfair decisions for veterans of color. So this month and every month is a great opportunity and huge responsibility for each of us. Stand in solidarity with black vets and VA staff and to commit to keeping this country's fundamental promises to black vets and to all of us. Because they deserve the very best and we can never give them anything else. God bless you all. With that, Chair Faulkner, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you for your slide presentation and comments. We Thank thought you. that would be apropos for you. <laughs> well, before we get into the slide presentation, I uh, just want to give you, uh, Director Joel, I brought up the fact that, you know, uh, that was the Secretary of the VA. He's my boss. Uh, so uh, when I'm working, I work for him. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, they are very focused on making sure that we take care of minority veterans, women veterans, LGBTQ veterans. We have an office specifically focused on their needs, all right? They're not alone. We have people that are actually work in those spaces, ensure they're connected, ensure they're included in the things we do in the VA and make sure they receive the services, benefits they deserve. So it's a lot of things when you, when you look at organizations, many of them don't do that, all right? So we have a secretary in the VA that actually focuses on building offices that focus on these specific groups, uh, particularly, and what I do every day is and my job is to make sure they're connected to their benefits. That's women veterans, uh, uh, veterans of color, uh, LGBTQ veterans, just veterans overall, because many of them feel not included and we wanted to create a space to make sure that they understand that you work for these benefits, you sacrifice for these benefits, and you should be connected to those benefits. So that story is just for the VA, but that story is for all of us, even in everyday life. Uh, it represents veterans, but it also represents us in our communities and how we deal with things and the things that we went through as well. So let's continue to walk in unity. So you can pull up those slides. Thank you. And we're gonna go over just a couple slides of just black history, just data uh, in regards to uh, you know, Black History Month and just sharing with you. We'll leave the stardom and the uh, pomp and circumstance and the great things we're gonna hear from the audience members that are gonna come up and share with us. We want to just give you a couple of data points about Black uh, History Month. So according to 2020, uh, the decennial census, the black or African-American alone population in Riverside County is 156,477. The black or African-American alone population in the state of California is 2,237,044, as reflected in the 2020 uh, decennial uh, census numbers. In the 2020 census results, the black and African-American alone population in the United States totaled up to 41,104,200. Um, additionally, the black or African-American alone population in the state of California accounts for about 5.44% of the nation's black or African-American alone population. <clears throat> the black or African American alone population in Riverside County accounts for about 6.99% of the black or African American alone population in the state of California. And there are resources there that you can look up as well if you would like those numbers as well. Next slide. So let's talk about the black history timeline. Uh, let's talk about the colonial era, 1619. Slavery in America begins in Jamestown for the labor intensive but lucrative tobacco crop. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence is signed, all men were supposedly created equal. Post-American Revolution, 1793, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 is passed in Congress, securing rights for a slaveholder to recover and escape slave. 1857, Dred Scott versus Sanford, the Supreme Court case finds that US Constitution does not protect or recognize free or enslaved African Americans as citizens. Civil War and Reconstruction, 1863, Lincoln uh, uh, signs the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, changing the legal status of three million slaves in designated areas of the Confederacy from slave to free. 1865, the 13th Amendment is passed, abol abolishing slavery throughout the United States. So we thought. 1868, the 14th Amendment is passed, guaranteeing citizenship rights and equal protection under the law. 1870, the 15th Amendment is passed, guaranteeing that a citizen's right to vote 
would not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Then we enter, enter Jim Crow era. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson legitimizes state laws reestablishing racial segregation in southern states. 1921, the Greenwood Massacre occurs, where mobs of white residents attack black residents and businesses in the wealthy black Wall Street district in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Civil Rights Movement, 1954, in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court unanimously overturns the decision of Plessy versus Ferguson and legally mandate public schools to integrate. 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is passed. It prohibits discrimination in public facilities and in the employment of African Americans. 1968, the Fair Housing Act is passed to ensure equal housing opportunity for minorities. Now we move into modern day. 1868, Martin Luther King Day is first celebrated as a national holiday. 2001, President-elect George W. Bush nominates Colin Powell to Secretary of State. Condoleezza Rice is also appointed to the position of National Security Advisor. And in 2008, Barack Obama is elected the 44th President of the United States. 2020, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is elected the 46th Vice President of the United States. And in 2023, Hakeem Jeffries selected as Minority Leader of the U.S. House of Representatives. So it gives you a little timeline of where we, where, we, where we came from and where we are today. Next slide, please. In my final message, uh, again, like we said, this is African American Black History Month, Black History Month. So let's celebrate our uniqueness. Uh, let's celebrate what we bring to the table. Let's celebrate the culture of the black experience in America, and not only in America, but in Temecula. Uh, and as we always say, let's ace it, acknowledge, celebrate, and educate. And I have these two photos over here, two great men, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King. You know, we can march all day, we can protest, but how you change things is through legislation. You know, if, if Frederick Douglass hadn't had the ear of, of, of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation probably wouldn't have happened. There was a relationship there that he established. He was one of the most articulate and smartest intelligent men Second, pretty much to Lincoln in regards to, uh, he always sought out his, his opinion on things. So here's Frederick Douglass who taught himself to read and write and became one of the most intelligent Americans that ever walked this earth. And then second, so Abraham Lincoln there, and second, Martin Luther King. Had Martin Luther King had not had the relationship and being able to be uh, uh, not aggressive but being point and specific in addressing issues with first Kennedy, President Kennedy, and second Johnson, we wouldn't have had the Civil Rights Act. His pressure, his, his position, his focus to make, make sure he stayed determined to ensure that not nah, we're gonna walk and we're gonna protest, but to change things we have to do it in legislation, all right? So that's all for all of us. If you wanna change things, you gotta show up. You gotta make your, make your comments, you gotta, you gotta fight against anything that's not about uniting and, and moving our, your effort, our effort forward. So legislation, show up and show out. So I so wanna end there uh, with that uh, and, and I wanna make sure that uh, I continue to press forward as we continue to celebrate Black History Month. So I think next we have a community service program report. Yes, we have our community services director with us, and she's going to highlight all the great things that are going on for Black History Month within the city. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing in community services. In our Temecula Community Services Department, we like to say that we create community through people, parks, and programs. And part of what we do is to bring in a lot of um, cultural opportunities whenever we have that chance. So for Black History Month, we have several events going on. Um, we have several events over the theater. Coming up on Saturday, February 10th, Sherry Berry Music will be presenting Cross That River. For those of you who don't know Sherry Williams, she has been a long time since the theater opened. She has been a regular at the theater. She hosts Jazz at the Merck every Thursday night. Um, she curates a lot of the programs we bring in. She's just an exceptional performer as well as producer, and so this will be a don't miss concert. And then we're presenting an original dramatic production called Rosetta and the Mount Calvary Missionary Club. That will be playing at the Merck, which is the smaller venue in front of the theater. Both of them are located on Main Street right here in Old Town. 
and that is playing on February 4th, 18th, and 23rd at 7.30 p.m. I've heard that both of these performances are sh selling out very quickly, so by all means, if you're interested, you can go on our website, you can walk by the theater, you can give us a call and get your tickets. And then I'd like to let everyone know that over at our Temecula Valley Museum, which is also right here in Old Town, if you're not fami familiar, if you go down Front Street, you'll see Sam Hicks Monument Park, and on the right-hand side is a hidden gem, which is our little local museum. And they have brought in an exhibition right now called Black and White and Black and White, Images of Dignity, Hope, and Diversity in America. And that exhibition is a collection of photographs by photographer John Johnson, who between 1910 and 1925 uh, documented his experience as an African American in the United States, primarily in his hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska. And he did a lot of photographic work that was considered so significant that the Smithsonian just purchased 60 of his images, and they will be displaying them in three exhibitions. So it's really just top caliber mm -hmm. photographic work, very, very moving. Nice. If you have the yeah. chance, nice. that will be here in Old Town at the museum until March 24th. And then finally, over the library, we have a literature display. If you haven't been to Ronald H. Roberts Temecula Public Library, that's on Paba Road, kind of at the top of the hill as you go between Inez and Margarita. And the library is an exceptional resource every day of the year. Um, but for different months, they put together special curated collections of literature, and they have their Black History Month curated collection up now. So that concludes my report. And thank you again for having me here tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel like we have a video message, uh, Director? Yes, we do. Um, Supervisor Chuck Washington really wanted to be here in person. As you guys know, um, every year, uh, or last year, for every proclamation, if he was not here in person, he sent a video message, and he's continuing that tradition. Um, Chris, if we can play the video message from Supervisor Chuck Washington. Good evening, Temecula students and families. I'm Riverside County Third District Supervisor Chuck Washington. During Black History Month, we honor and recognize the countless contributions and achievements of African Americans throughout history. In our nation's past, black achievements have not always been acknowledged and unfortunately at times kept in the shadows. And that is why today we make conscientious efforts to commemorate Black History Month. It's incredibly important that we show up because when we do, we recognize that black history is Riverside County history, black history is American history, mm -hmm. and black history is world history. Mm -hmm. Tonight, I encourage you all to continue being a leader in your school, in your community, and beyond. Because what you do now makes a difference for the next generation. Let us embrace the spirit of Black History Month, not just in February, but every day, as we strive towards a future where every voice is heard, every story is valued, and every life is cherished. The 1926, Dr. Carter G. Wilson, initiated Black History Month, recognizing the profound impact of African American contributions, often overlooked from us during this year. As we said, Let's honor this legacy by embracing diversity and amplifying voices that have shaped our community. Black History Month isn't just a reflection of the past. It's a commitment to a more inclusive future where every story is acknowledged, celebrated, and contributes to the rich tapestry of our county. Together, let us build bridges of understanding, respect, and unity, ensuring that the essence of Black history resonates in every corner of your city. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It seems like we have some in-person comments by mayor and- uh, We do, we do. Um, our mayor is here tonight and we're grateful for him, uh, grateful to him for being here tonight. Well, first off, I wanna thank you guys for doing this. This is always amazing and you guys do such an amazing job with it and I really love your acronym, uh, ACING IT, yeah. because acknowledge, celebrate, and educate. Mm -hmm. And to me, this part is a lot about education. I learn something every time I come to this. Yeah. And so that's what's super important is just have people understand, you know, where 
uh, the black people have come from and what they've went through. And so I totally appreciate the fact that you guys are willing to um, bring this to our city. I mean, this is, I, I love the fact that you guys do this. So I appreciate you guys and happy Black History Month. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We also have um, an in-person comment tonight from our Ready Commission Liaison, Council Member Schwenk. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me a moment to uh, share some thoughts with you. Uh, I want to thank the community for being here tonight. Uh, it's very important that we continue to, uh, to make these uh, spaces feel safe and, and welcoming for everyone. Um, I want to thank the Ready Commission for the time and energy that you all have put into this. Uh, I know this is our second year here doing it this way. Um, we've had some growing pains. We've had some difficulties. We've changed it again. And um, you know, all I can hope for is that we continue to do things better for our community. Um, I'd like to thank TCSD uh, and your team for all of the programs and, and everything that we do in our community uh, to celebrate Black History Month. I think um, it's quite wonderful. And, uh, and I know I, um, much like our Mayor Stewart was talking about educating, it's very important that we do that forward facing with opportunities for all people to come and learn and experience and enjoy uh, black history and black culture black arts. Um, so with that, um, education is always a key component. I started reading this book. It's called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, so everyone go buy it. It was an <laughs> Oprah book, I think. Um, so I started reading it this month to learn a little bit more. Um, the video, the Veterans Affairs video was, was powerful. When you start to look at history, um, we just need to do better. Um, so I hope as a community, we start to do better. Um, and it can start here and, and it continue here. Um, and it starts with ready, continues with ready. It starts with our community and continues with our community. Um, so I thank you all for being here and giving us this opportunity. And I'm really hopeful to uh, listen to some of the uh, other speakers tonight and learn a little bit more about uh, my fellow Temecula residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schwenk. And um, Chair Faulkner, now would be a great time for you to go ahead and read the official proclamation. And then I know we have several public comments. Okay, thank you so much, Director. We'll go into the proclamation. Um, the City of Temecula Proclamation, whereas National African American History Month, also known as Black History Month, celebrates the contributions that African Americans have made to American history in their struggles for equality and deepens our understanding of our nation's history. And whereas in 1915, noted black scholar, Dr. Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, A-S-A-L-H, and initiated Negro History Week in February 1926, a month that includes both the birthday of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And whereas in 1969, educators and students in Kent State University proposed Black History Month, resulting in the first month long celebration in February 1970. And whereas 50 years after the first celebration, President Gerald R. Ford officially recognized Black History Month during the bicentennial of the United States, 1976, urging Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area, area or endeavor throughout our history, and whereas every president since has recognized and celebrated the many achievements and contributions made by African Americans to the economic and cultural development of our nation, and whereas African American residents contribute greatly to the economic viability and the high quality of life of our community as professionals, business owners, educators, students, volunteers, veterans, and more. And now, therefore, I, Mayor James Stewart, on behalf of the City of Temecula, hereby proclaim this month of February 2024 to be National African American History Month and call upon our community to learn more about the history of African Americans to observe this month with appropriate programs and activities. In witness thereof, I hereunto uh, set my hand and calls the seal of the city of Temecula to be affixed, 8th day of February, James Stewart, Mayor, uh, Director, Randy Joel, City Clerk.
right, are there any public comments? Yes, we do, um, Chair Faulkner. Um, we have several. Um, as this is a business item, each speaker will have five minutes. Our first speaker is Tanisha Morell, to be followed by Genesis Kakoa. Hey, give it up. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to address the Ready Commission. My name is Tanisha Morell, and I am a member of the Marietta Temecula Area Alumni Chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Our chapter was chartered on May 17th, 2020 by 28 phenomenal women who are ready to serve the communities in which they live and work. The membership continues to look forward to making an impact and creating a legacy of service not only in Temecula, but in the communities of Marietta, Canyon Lake, Himid, Lake Matthews, Lake Elsinore, Menifee, Paris, San Jacinto, Sun City, Wildemar, and Winchester. Now, our sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, was founded on January 13, 1913, by 22 collegiate women at Howard University. We are a private, non-for-profit organization whose purpose is to provide assistance and support through established programs in local communities throughout the world. Delta currently has more than 1,000 collegiate and alumni chapters located in the United States and Canada in Japan, both Tokyo and Okinawa, Germany, the Virgin Islands, Bermuda, the Bahamas, Jamaica, West Africa, Southern Africa, the United Arab Emirates, Republic of Korea, and the United Kingdom. Well, that's a lot, yes. As a sisterhood composed primarily of black college-educated edu women, the sorority seriously considers the issues impacting the black community and boldly confronts and challenges of um, African Americans and hence all Americans. The major programs of the sorority are based upon the five point programmatic thrust, which is economic development, educational development, international awareness and involvement, physical and mental health, and political awareness and involvement. One of the primary ways in which Delta impacts communities is through its commitment to public service. Delta has a long-standing tradition of engaging in social action in initiatives, including voting rights, education, economic development, and healthcare. Our programs, such as the Delta Academy, the Gyms, and Embody, focus on promoting academic excellence, leadership, development, and social responsibility among young girls and boys. These initiatives provide mentorship, educational opportunities, life skills and training to the undeserved youth in the community. In addition to its commitment to service and advocacy efforts, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated also has a significant impact on communities through its leadership development programs, such as the Delta Leadership Academy and the Regional Leadership Conference. Both provide training and networking opportunities to women in the organization, enabling them to become effective leaders in their communities and beyond. These initiatives allow us to embrace Temecula's motto, old traditions, new opportunities. Our members are educators, mental health clinicians, musicians, parents, volunteers, attorneys, et cetera. And this community is where we all live, where we work, where we shop, where we play, where we raise our children in this community. And the chapter has volunteered with Menifee Better Together, helping to spruce up homes for residents in need of assistance, We've also assisted with Habitat for Humanity, where we've painted homes for seniors. We've collaborated with the Marietta Unite Methodist Church, aiding community members with food insecurities, sock and blanket distributions to six organizations throughout Moreno Valley, and we still have additional donations to make to provide to other organizations in Lake Elsinore and Marietta. We've provided food donations to Crossroads Church in Temecula, and we've designated more than $20,000 and scholarships to graduating seniors from high schools in our service area, including Orange Vista, Lakeside, Temecula Valley, Marietta Mesa, Temescal Canyon, Vista Marietta, San Jacinto, and Himmet School. Marietta Temecula alumni celebrates the rich diversity in the community via its September breakfast held at Pachanga Resort Casino for more than 300 guests each and every year for the past three years. During each annual breakfast, social action awards are given, 
to local community members for their entiring, untiring commitment to service all aligned with our programmatic thrust. Overall, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has a profound impact on communities through its commitment to public service, to advocacy, to leadership and development, and our members are dedicated to improving the lives of those around them, and our efforts make a significant difference in the community across the United States and beyond. Thank you, and we receive the proclamation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Genesis Kakoa, to be followed by Chris Gadsden. Hi, um, my name is Genesis Kekoa. I'm the president of the Black Student Union at Temecula Valley High School. And I wanted to sing the Black National Anthem like I did last year, so. Lift every voice and sing until has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun March on until victory is won. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Gadsden to be followed by Jillian Larson. Well, to follow that, great, great job, Genesis. Um, my name is Mr. Gadsden. I am the co-sponsor -sp for Black Student Union at Temecula Valley High School. Um, it is a great privilege to serve our student body. Um, our club, if you want to call it, is inclusive to all. Uh, we want to make sure that we have conversations where they might be difficult topics, but we're going to have them in a safe space. Um, and we do that through the leadership of Genesis and her team, and along with my team, which is uh, fellow counselor, Mrs. Teachout, and then also Mr. Hyde, who's our English teacher. And so we have a great team that supports, and also Ms. Knight, who is here, Sergeant Master Knight, and it was great that we had the VA uh, comments as well. Um, but we are here, and we wanna partner and work extensively I'm gonna be on your community service website because I believe we, we gotta send our kids to some of these events. So that'll be a great experience. What I wanted to bring forward today was two things. The first is uh, we have different events on campus. And one of those first events for Black History Month was we had a karaoke uh, event. And hopefully this is showing here. 
as you can see, it is open to all. They could select different songs from different artists um, that were of African American heritage. Um, and so they were able to sing to their heart's content during lunch, which was an awesome experience. And then they also were able to act out the song as well um, and sing. And, and like you, I said before, it's open to all. So it was not just all of our African-American students. And then it was led out once again by our fearless leader, Miss Genesis, as well. Um, so it was a great event. Our next event that's upcoming is going to be this Saturday, actually. Um, our district, um, since I've been in this district for seven years, the district is paying for a bus for all schools to go down to the Black College Expo in LA. So that'll be happening this Saturday. We'll be down there to see all the different universities, not just the uh, HBCUs, historically black universities, but UCR is down there and all the other different universities within the state of California. And so that's another way that we can get out into the community and see what, how our kids can go forward and be lights uh, within this world where we definitely need. So I thank you once again, and we will always be here to support and continue our partnership together. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Our next speaker is Jillian Larson to be followed by Stephen Schwartz. Good evening, Chair Faulkner, commissioners and city staff, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my feelings and my comments again. Once more, I'm gonna read so I don't forget something. Uh, in case people didn't know, I grew up during the horrendous apartheid regime and saw what hate, bigotry, ignorance created, oppression and destruction of a nation. It took incredible courage and sacrifice for thousands from all the races in South Africa to speak up and to do something, supported internationally by many as it was so wrong. In 1992, apartheid was abolished and the healing could begin. Nelson Mandela and all those working towards ending apartheid, it was to create a country for all people that, they were, that were there. I haven't been back home in South Africa since 2007, but I was there for two months this last year. We had the most awesome trip with so many amazing experiences, and I'm asked what my favorite part of the trip was. My reply is always, we were all people. I watched people of colors, dress, language, religions, age, size, and shape, all being the people of our country. I watched the young people all playing together. I watched people all eating together in restaurants. I watched people coming off the planes and people greeting them, all because we could now. Education creating understanding dispelled the ignorance and the barriers, the hate, the oppression, the bigotry, and the country started to heal. I watched droves of engaged school children of all colors on field trips learning the history of our country. They felt determined not to repeat what generations before them had endured, and I also saw their pride in our country of South Africa that we were all part of. May we all live with the African spirit of Ubuntu, which is treating others and ourselves with compassion, generosity, grace, and respect. We felt the spirit everywhere during our travels. Ubuntu is alive and well all over the country among the people. So I want to thank our community in town. I would like to thank you all and celebrate with you for being a huge part of the fabric of this town. You all make your own history every day to enhance your lives and those around you to make Temecula the town we all love. Let us all be the people of Temecula. Please know that all of you make a significant contribution. So keep on keeping on. May we all practice Ubuntu as we create magical harmony in Temecula. Mm -hmm. And I end with the Zulu greeting, which is Sawabona, which means I see you. I see you all and recognize the importance 
the worth, the dignity of every person. Sawabona, everybody. And may we all live with the spirit of Ubuntu and make Temecula what we love and want to thrive within. Thank you for the evening opportunity. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Steven Schwartz to be followed by our final speaker, Andrew Robinson. Although I am uh, an elected member of the school board, I am speaking for myself as a citizen and an educator. I want to thank my friend Eric and all of you for um, continuing this tradition of honoring the people in our community. It's been my pleasure as a school board member to be able to make strong relationships with a lot of the people there in the audience. Chris and Genesis and Stephanie. And it, as, as a school board member, we're uh, charged with being a part of our community and making sure that we represent everyone. That's been my aim on the school board, is to make sure that every one of our students is heard, every one of our students gets the best quality education and the best quality schools that we could provide. So I want to thank you guys for what you do, and I want to thank our kids for being as great as they are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Our final speaker is Andrew Robinson. Andrew. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking in front of everybody here. Uh, we are the three members of the BSU board. Uh, I'm the senior president, Andrew Robinson. Uh, and first, we'd like to give a brief backstory of our BSU from last year. So, um, so some of the events we had last year is we had a Black History Month celebration day uh, with, with, with Step Team. Um, we also hosted multiple potlucks. We had many singing lawn events. Um, and this is not just the past year, but also the events we've had so far. Um, we've also had meetings about hair, discrimination, and we also recently had a public speech from Mr. Mack talking, about, talking to the black students about how to build success as a black person in our community. Um, we also had a field trip to the Black College Expo. We also hosted multiple walkouts because of things going on with the TVC board. And we went to the September dinner or the Delta dinner um, last September and the September before. And then we also are trying to grow out our BSU a lot. Do you want me to talk about the events from this year? Oh, it's right here. Okay, cool. Uh, and then for this year, our aim and our focus is to inspire the black students on campus and uh, let them know that they're heard and they have a safe space to uh, commune with each other and with us, the board. Uh, also to reignite the pride of uh, black students in our student body. Um, a lot of the board, I'm not all of them, a lot of the members are dispersed and we'd like to bring them back into the BSU board and um, educate people not only in our own community but in the uh, non-black community uh, to create more unity on campus. Uh, and then some of the events we are holding this year um, is the Divine Nine this week, uh, on Friday. Uh, two of the members that spoke earlier will be in attendance. Um, we also have the Diversity Showcase, um, where different cultures at our school speak about um, their experiences and share uh, their cultures with students across campus. Um, we also have a potluck at the end of uh, Black History Month to celebrate not only the accomplish accomplishments of black people, but the accomplishments of black students on campus, even being able to hold a Black History Month uh, in a predominantly white school. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That concludes that conclude public comments. All right. Director, if you want to uh, set us up for the next item, uh, our future home ownership opportunities for youth. First of all, uh, a big thank you to everybody who came out for Black History Month. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I see my counterpart um, from the school district in the audience as well, Dr. Price, and I appreciate you being here. 
Um, so um, we would love for you to stay for this second topic because it's directly relevant, especially to the students, um, directly relevant to um, barriers that you all might be facing in the now and into the future um, in the home ownership space. So, um, so I'll, with that, um, Chair Faulkner, I'll just go ahead and, and get started. I just wanted to put that out there yes, in case. Yes, please do. Um, all right, so second item. So on January 16th, um, staff actually met with um, Councilmember Alexander regarding the topic of housing to be considered by the Ready Commission. Um, Councilmember Alexander is in the audience, so thank you for being here, Councilmember. Um, she had asked that the topic be forwarded to the Ready Commission with the concurrence of the full City Council. Um, after a productive discussion, we clarified that her focus was specifically on the next generation and how they will achieve home ownership. She concurred with the following approach for staff to address the item with the Ready Commission. Number one, identify the barriers that the next generation, specifically youth, may be facing now and into the future as they seek home ownership opportunities here in Temecula. Number two, analyze these barriers to determine if existing community resources, agencies, nonprofits, other organizations exist to address these barriers and match the particular barrier with the provider. Number three, identify and analyze any gaps, which barriers are going unaddressed or, and or need more attention. And finally, make actionable recommendations to the city council on those particular gaps. So for tonight, we are asking the Ready com uh, Commission to be focused on that first item and based on their professional expertise in various fields along with their lived experience, including in the military, education, real estate, nonprofit associations, conduct a high level discussion around the topic of barriers that the next generation and youth of the community may face to home ownership opportunities. I will share, Chair Faulkner, I did have an opportunity to spend some time um, yesterday with IB students at Great Oak High School um, and just kind of did a test question um, really quickly for the students that were present um, and things like um, generational wealth, things like creditworthiness, things like um, access to education in the home ownership space, all of those things were coming up. So uh, we look forward to you having a discussion and going ahead and um, we will be making extensive notes. This is also being recorded. Mm -hmm. um, and then we anticipate that the Ready Commission will have this topic before you probably three or four times. Um, so with that, I would also encourage any students who maybe haven't filled out a public speaker comment for this item, you are welcome to go ahead and um, go ahead and fill out a public speaker comment form and go ahead and give it to the commission secretary. And as they're having their discussion, we would love to hear from you as well since you are present. With that, Chair Faulkner, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. And in the past, uh, Director, you have the questions up on the uh, screen. Do you? So we can be able to look at that. Oh, okay. Well, um, for tonight, you actually only have one question, so we didn't have a slide. All right. It is really just to have that 30,000 foot view discussion based on your lived experience and your professional expertise on what barriers do you think that young people in this community might be facing now or in the future in regards to home ownership. Sounds good. Sounds good. So anyone want to kick it off uh, and start the conversation? Anybody ready and prepared? real estate agents over here to the left. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. So first of all, when you think of barriers, you think of obstacles, um, you think of challenges. And the first word that comes to my mind is gap, generational gap. We do know there is a wide gap between um, people of color and people uh, and Caucasians. So I think what, what we need to do as far as the foundation mm -hmm is we need to educate the, the young adult on financial, as far as banking, credit score, how you build your credit score, how you can negatively impact your credit score, and then the importance of a, a credit score. I think we need those fundamentals in order to teach them how to not just get a home, but to keep a home. And, and that could be a big issue right there. So I think that the start in building a foundation is education, educating them on what it means to be a homeowner. 
um, how do you get to being home ownership? Because there are barriers that are out there. You have affordable housing in Temecula that is a challenge. Actually, housing period all over the state is a challenge. But I think that the key to it is start to build this. Make the foundation where they know um, what it means to own a home. How, um, what are some of the grants that are available? What are some of the processes that it takes to even get prepared to financially to do that? How do I save? How do I build a savings account? Um, how do I pick the right credit cards so that I am building my credit and not just spending and, and not knowing that there is a debt ratio when you look at buying a home? So I think it's a lot of education, and I'm sure, Jackie, as a realtor like I am, we get clients all the time, and these aren't youth. These are adults, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and the biggest challenge is they don't know about credit card, how it negatively affect their credit. So you need to get them while they're young and start letting them know what a savings account is, what a checking account is, how they can save their money, how they can build their credit without going and spending everything. And that will position them to be in a better um, spot when it's time for them to start looking for a home and they can keep that home. So that's the biggest challenge, education, Anyone can look at out and say, I want to buy that house. But how are you prepared to buy that house? Or I want to own a home. How are you prepared to own a home? You got to start with the basics. And I think that is the foundation right now that I would say. Yeah, you guys have something to add? I know Jackie did, so am I right? Thank you, guys. <laughs> yes, um, I, yeah, I think education is so important. Uh, and there's a lot for our youth already to be educated on in life in general. But when it comes to housing, um, if you have conversations with your parents, I think the difference between renting and owning is huge. Um, and it changes your family. It changes how you operate as a family. It changes how you um, act within your community. It changes the stability of your community. So it's really important to learn that as soon as you can so you'll have that stability throughout your life. Um, we have a lot of different things going on now, especially since COVID. We have a lot of different ways that we are employed, and especially for our youth coming up. They're looking at different kind of job opportunities, so whether that's remote, whether that's um, shorter term gigs, whether that's contract work. So that's something else to take into consideration because the traditional unemployment um, way of getting a job, right, is you have a job, you work in it for five years, you work in it for 10 years, you save your money, you have this great opportunity to um, qualify for loans. But now that the job um, aspect is changing for our youth, it really um, starts to limit them if they don't show a consistency in their employment. So we have to figure out a workaround um, around that. Um, it is a huge barrier. Um, having those conversations with our families, like what, where were they when they decided this is the time for us to buy a house as a family? That general wealth is a huge aspect in regards to owning a home. Um, when your family is stable and owns a home, it's always easier for the kids to own a home because number one, they have that example. There's equity in the house. Usually the parents can help a little bit with that or they can set the example for their um, kids to that home ownership really is worth it. Um, and then the conversation of um, our youth, do they think that owning a home is important? So those the generations just think different, which is another barrier. Like, what are they thinking? They're thinking, oh, we're just going to travel. We're going to, you know, we're going to work these jobs as we need to. So is it really important to us? And then they come around to 35, 40 years old, and they're like, wait a minute. Now I'm, time, I'm ready to settle down, and prices are so high, we can't afford it. And um, it's interesting with prices, right, because it's all relative. When, we, when I bought a house 20 years ago, our first house, um, it was so expensive, and we thought we were going to die. We're like, six months, we'll be paying bankruptcy, and here we are 20 years later, and I would have bought six of those houses, right? So um, it is all very, very relative, but I encourage our youth not to despair, to really get it as educated as possible. There is resources in our community. We're fortunate enough to have a city that's open to these conversations and wanting to have these conversations because we want to give you opportunity and we want you to have the knowledge that you need to be successful. Um, so definitely, you know, those are the kind of barriers that I'm thinking of. Thanks, Commissioner Steve. Commissioner Evertoff, you got anything? You think we're going to cover this in a half hour? Seriously? Um, we're going to have multiple conversations about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so you really, with home ownership, there's two sides of it. 
Uh, one is make more money. The more math you take, the more money you make. And so um, education, education, education um, usually leads to more stable jobs. Uh, the more, the higher the education, the less likely you'll encounter um, the, the vagaries of the economy, the ups and the downs, the roller coaster rides that we all go through. You can withstand that. The difference between somebody who has dropped out of high school versus somebody who has a master's is more than a million dollars in lifetime earnings. And not only that, but the likelihood of a person with a master's getting laid off versus a person with, uh, with a high school or less education getting laid off. Well, to be honest, yeah, the high school or whatever. The second part of home ownership is having homes to buy. And this region, this state, um, is, is woefully behind. We need, what, 600,000 homes to catch up? Maybe more to meet the needs of our communities throughout the state. Um, what does that entail? It means not just single family homes. It means a variety of different types of um, product. Condos, apartments, attached townhomes, row homes, all of those things have to be adopted. Cities don't necessarily want to give up those types of um, spaces, let's say reusing, um, reusing retail areas to be implemented and, and build homes or infill. Uh, infill projects are difficult. Infill projects have environmental challenges. Uh, reducing the challenges of building infill projects, that would help. Building homes, that's, that's a biggie. Um, CEQA reform, California Environmental Quality Act. That is a requirement that any builder meet a variety of requirements before they can even build one stick in the ground. Well, right now that system is broken. And uh, there's a part of that called the Environmental um, uh, Impact Report that's within CEQA. And that, that report which is really just a checklist of impacts on air and water and tribal uh, cultural impacts, et cetera. Um, that whole system's busted, and it's been busted for about 20 years, making it ever so difficult. There were some 11,500 homes planned for the uh, town of Nuevo. Um, those are worse, at the time, affordable homes. It has taken 17, Actually, uh, that's actually 20 years to get those homes approved. 20 years. And in the meantime, those home prices have gone up and up and up and further out of reach. And these homes are still locked up in the courts because of in various Environmental Quality Act problems. Not because of the project, but because of the system. And so that is something that like that. It's a complicated topic. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, it's great, make more money, stay in school, all that, but to meet home ownership, to meet the demands of our region, way more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Eventhal. Vice Chair. Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I agree with my, um, both all of my colleagues here. So, I think we're facing a lot of barriers, certainly, as it applies to our youth and home ownership. In fact, these are conversations that I have in my home all of the time, um, especially recently. You know, I have a, uh, I have a college level student in his second year, and what does that look like? How is there hope, right? Is there hope for him to be able to, to own a home? Um, so I guess the, the first thing I think of is the educational piece of it is, you know, are we, especially in our local town here, so are our are, are current career pathways commensurate with our local um, businesses? Are, are they working together in order to ensure that there is employment for our youth moving forward so that they can own a home? That's a, that's a big deal. Um, we have some phenomenal pathways, but does it reflect our local community? So that is, I think, um, something that we should look to identify, especially as we move forward um, in, in bridging that gap and creating that analysis. Uh, you know, it used to be, I think back to my grandparents and what that looks like, and I remember um, generations before, uh, there were those rent-to-own type programs, and we just don't see that. 
Um, so, so that's kind of another area where there is something there that would allow people to be able to scaffold themselves to a place of ownership, and we just don't have that anymore. Um, I also think in terms of identifying those barriers, we, our young people, our youth get a amazing education, certainly here in TVUSD, but are we focusing um, on the big picture rather than ensuring that we're just um, hitting the standards that we know that we need to do anyway? So are we hitting those financial literacy pieces? Are we talking about um, fiscal responsibility in order to set them up to a place where um, they need to be like um, Ms. Wilson spoke about, you know, do they have that, right? Credit scores, are they aware of that? And yes, we have classes about those things, and, but, but are we really um, developing a place and, and a curriculum that fits that in order to, to see the success that we're looking to see as a community um, and, and kind of bridge that gap again? Uh, that's, that's something that I think um, is, is also important. Uh, and I agree as well, Commissioner Eventov, 100% that an undergraduate degree is like a high school diploma at this point. It, you have to have a graduate degree um, or, or more in order to be in a place where um, you're going to have that level of wealth and home ownership. And that's something that is just a product of, I think, our society at this point and where, where we are. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think education is something that I, I want our youth to continue to strive for. Um, and to continue to work for and, and that achievement. But you're right, the more math, the more <laughs> <Like> that. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um, so it is important that we start to look at um, what types of, of jobs um, and where the, the, the housing prices are and what those pieces look like. And again, do we have enough of those housing? It, are we, is everything commensurate? And, and that is not the case currently. Um, the generational wealth, we need to talk about that. I mean, you know, in terms of how do you start that, right? We think about, does it exist already? But how, do, how does, are we providing education and awareness in, in how to start creating generational wealth right now for people? Most, most people, um, you know, it's hard, especially coming out of a situation like, like COVID um, where a lot of people had to get back onto their feet. So many of us are still trying to keep our heads above water. Um, and so to think about how to allocate our finances in order to create generational wealth today is a conversation that needs to start happening in terms of education and awareness, and we can do that as a community. So that is something that I think that we need to additionally focus on in terms of um, identifying that barrier and, and pushing for a further a level of analysis and education for, for everyone. Oh, well, thanks, Chair. Um, all great uh, input on this topic of uh, this affordable housing, I mean, and future home ownership opportunities for youth. I just take you back when I grew up. I'm a, 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 a you know, I'm a black man, so you know that. Uh, but from Memphis, Tennessee, I grew up in a black community, so uh, a predominantly black community. And, and we lived, we started in the country home ownership. We didn't own, we rented. Uh, but there were like, you know, multiple people in a home and trying to survive and make it. You know, moving to the projects, tough spot, you know, living there because, you know, uh, home ownership was not attainable at that point in time. So we rented. Finally, job opportunities came because, you know, stepfather was a construction person and, and my wife, my mother was an administrator. Uh, we moved into a home, <clears throat> very small home, <clears throat> but better from where we came. So as you can see, the progression up. Uh, but both of them didn't have a college degree. Uh, <clears throat> and both were not really, you know, focused on managing money correctly, and that's that's generationally, you know, wasn't passed down to them from their parents. Uh, now, out of that home, I go into the military. So, and in military, when you start off as a D1, you don't make a lot of money. So I couldn't afford housing, but they had housing for me, birthing on the base, uh, getting married, living on base, and finally, two incomes, being able to afford housing, you know, moving out to Temecula and uh, with the two-income home. Uh, as you know, military, you start off low if you come in and you, progressions as you make rank, you make more money, you have more responsibility. Uh, so it puts you in a position where you can have home ownership. Uh, so the education piece, and I, I got it, and, and improve your education, improve your opportunity, and I got it, but the challenge of that is, uh, 
it costs. It costs. And most parents may not have that opportunity to pay that, or the child has got to take out a loan. So already we know that that increases a loan payback, in addition, if, which puts them in a position not to be able to have home ownership uh, and, and being to either stand at home with their parents or stand on a dorm, which costs, or renting with multiple people to, 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 to even survive and have a home. Uh, so with me, because I had a GI Bill, my thing is what can I do to set my kids up uh, to ensure that they have the ability to get a good start uh, as they step out into this thing we call life for the first time. So I passed my, you know, my GI Bill over to my daughter. Luckily I had it, so she, did, she paid all her college from Clark Atlanta University was paid for. She didn't start off with debt. Uh, me and my wife sacrificed to buy a home in Atlanta where she was to create a generational wealth so she could stay in and, and we could assist until she can get on her feet to take over the home. Uh, so with home, with the prices uh, of home, and with $700,000, the median price of a home in, in, in California, is that still the case right now? Uh, so we're not even talking about young, young people being able to afford, we're talking about people that have been out here already trying to survive in California. And it's not just California, I just, I just came back from Atlanta. The housing market is going up across the country. Uh, it's becoming unaffordable in places where it used to be affordable, it's not affordable anymore. Uh, so the challenge is, you know, we have adults struggling and then we expect our kids to actually be able to step out and navigate this and, and, and get home ownership. Um, there, is, there are a lot of obstacles and, and, and journeys along the way you know, I was looking online, uh, if you are a foster child going into adulthood, or if you are a kid coming, you know, an, uh, that have, coming out of probation, they have a program called Transitional Age Youth Program, which provides housing for them. Actually, it provides the finance housing, it's low income housing, but for those two specific subsets, foster kid coming out to give them a, give them a chance and also uh, kids that are on probation and need a hand up until they get themselves together. So that may be a model to look at and see what they're doing there, but uh, if, if we can provide housing in that aspect, is there an opportunity to see, we can see that, that we can provide something for our young adults as well. So, um, so there are programs there. Um, home ownership, it, it's, it's, really, it's really tough. I mean, we're expecting our kids to automatically be able to come out of college and come, come out of high school and be able to get out there and get out. It's tougher now than it's ever been. I mean, I talk to neighbors on my street, their kids are still at home and they're 25, 28 years old and, and they're working a minimum wage job and trying and supporting their parents. And, you know, and, and they have a good plan, right? So you work, you can stay here, you have a room. We're gonna pay down a principal on our home to pay off our home early. Uh, and then we'll be able to help you get out. So that's some of the things you got to start thinking about. Uh, generationally, what can, you, what can we do as parents to, to, to set our kids up for success? Because it's not getting easier in society. It's getting tougher, all right? Give you an experience. My daughter went to Clark Atlanta University, had these great grandiose plans. I'm going to get my degree. As soon as I get my degree, I'm going to make six figures like my mom or dad makes. She thought it was going to automatically happen. It don't, don't have to work for it. You, you, you saw all these years of breaking our necks to make sure you guys were taken care of, and you missed the boat. It takes, we started at ground zero and worked our way up. And the challenge is many of them think that it, it's gonna, they have this idea that it's automatically, I'm hopping into that. It's automatically gonna happen for me. That's not the case, you gotta work hard for that. You gotta get out and work hard and be determined to get there. And it starts from groups, ground roots level and working your way up. But I think we as parents, and, and, and we have to help them out, you know? So we sacrificed for my daughter. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want her out there. And plus she was away from me, and I'm like, I want you in the same space. Uh, so me as a parent, I had to do what I need to do. So there's a lot of challenges and barriers that we gotta con we're gonna continue this conversation. Uh, but we really need to hear from, uh, from you as a community, kids of that age that are struggling with that, because I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> I'm not this, this 18 to 24, 25 year old that's out here looking at this. We really need to solve this problem and get your feedback on how we work together to, to solve this issue and see what we can do in our city, not only in our city, but across this country. It's, it's a problem. So 
and we as parents, they're ours forever. So we don't want to ever, ever uh, get them, let them go without making sure they're going to be uh, in a good position. So, so I'm going to add those comments onto what the rest of the commissioners have already stated. So you got something else, uh, Commissioner Evental? Yeah, two addendums. One is that when I say education, um, that doesn't exclude vocational training. Yes. Um, vocational training yes. when applicable, but it has to be something that will pay. Yes. You know, it has to be, you know, high voltage electrician easily makes six figures, mm -hmm. but it means going through and getting additional, and again, more math, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and getting that extra education. Another thing that, um, really two things. One is streamlining housing and urban development grant processes so that those that are applying it can speed the process up times money mm -hmm. you know price of a nail keeps going up mm -hmm. um, and lastly um, uh, we need as a city more advocacy at the state because right now whether it's transportation dollars whether it's housing dollars whether it's money to fight the homeless we keep having to battle to get our fair share the same equitable per capita amount of money from the state that the coastal communities, the more established communities, get. And right now it's inequitable. And that is a battle that needs to be taking place up in Sacramento for the most part. Mm -hmm. Anyway, those are three actual addendums. Uh, and then just uh, so those, those types of job, the plumbing, painters, those were the things that moved people up into the middle class and on. Unfortunately, many today think those. Some people, some think that those jobs are beneath them now. They think that they need to be on YouTube and blogging, and I'm like, that's how they're going to make their money. We got to be realistic. Hard work, determination. You have to put boot to ground uh, and really work. You know, if my job was taken away from me right now, I will take. I will work three, four jobs to make sure my family's safe, and I will kill myself doing it. All right. That's it, and a, and, a, and a toilet or in a bathroom scrubbing, if I have to do that, guess what? I'm going back to doing that. If it's to make sure my family's in a position. So uh, we have to look at these, look at the opportunities there, take the opportunities that's given, given us, and then when the opportunity arrives where you, where you can get where you wanna be, then we move forward, so. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Steve. Um, uh, Commissioner Pastorian had brought up the rental, and there is actually rent to own programs, but again, I would, or on the side of caution in regards to those, read the fine print all day long. Um, I think what are huge, the hugest barrier is that we just don't have entry level homes for our community. So our kids can't, our kids, our young adults, can't buy um, that one bedroom condo for $100,000 anymore. It's just not a thing that they can do. I mean, condos, a two bedroom condo is costing you probably $450,000 with a huge association every month. So um, that's what's unfortunate. So if, if anything, the, um, a welcome addition would be entry-level homes, um, have developers that come in and build those, and that way um, young people can build wealth and then eventually move up to whatever is going to meet their needs next. Um, but that would be definitely a recommendation and a barrier at the same time. So with that being said, I was thinking as you were talking, uh, Commissioner Steed, what about something like studio homes? Um, sort of like the dorm, but studio homes where they can still have their private area, um, their kitchenette and all of that, but it's teaching them how own home ownership, but it's also allowing them to be independent where they can shop, they can cook, they can clean and all that, but they're just smaller units because the average single family resident is seven something and then like Commissioner Steve said, a studio in our area is going to run you about $450,000 you just don't have that type of money as a young adult. So a studio type, they can buy that, something just to get them initially started and into home ownership. That's Thanks, it. Commissioner Wilson. Um, I'll pass back over to you. Are we thinking in the future of doing like any surveys to try to get feedback from the, the yeah, kids in that Yeah, so, so that's a really good point. Um, you guys had a, a great conversation. Um, you know, we do have one public speaker um, maybe we can hear from the public speaker, and then I will recap what I heard from you all, and, um, and next steps. Um, speaker is Lynn Kelly Lanier. Just the person we need, Habitat. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for bringing up this topic. It's very important um, to the whole, to not only this community, but every community. So I was planning on just listening today, but then uh, I just wanted to provide some uh, facts for you all. I agree with everything that has been mentioned up here, um, you know, just with education really needed and sequel reform and advocacy and generation, generational wealth gaps, all of that. Uh, some other things I wanted to point out, there was recently a study done by Harvard uh, saying that there are, there's a loss of units, housing units across the United States, uh, not just in California, of course, but all over. Uh, tens of thousands of units are being destroyed or uh, torn down each year, we just lose them. So not only is the supply not big enough to begin with, but we are actually losing some of the supply that exists. That's a big reason why some of the work we do is uh, home preservation. It's actually our biggest program. So we're trying to keep these units in existence and keep them affordable. Uh, home prices in Temecula, which of course you know are, um, are an issue. The average home price in Temecula right now is $645,000. Um, the average household income is um, $140,000, but in order to be able to afford the average home in Temecula, you need to have a household income of $177,000. That's a lot of money, $177,000, um, as you know. Um, the average commute time here in Temecula is 40 minutes, and some are a lot more. Um, you know, the the nature of work is changing, but we do need additional jobs here, workforce development to keep people here, which you know. Um, other things, you know, as the comment said, for adults, adults are struggling and the kids, you know, the kids might struggle too, but 50% of families in Temecula spend more than 30% of their household income on housing, and 25% of families in Temecula spend more than 50% of household income on housing. So it's really challenging to survive here and then also just demonstrating what that means as a family and to children. Uh, some other things, I know I don't have a ton of time here. The cost to build a home uh, for us, so we build ownership units. The house to build a home, or the cost to build a home is, is extravagant. And we need to do things like comply with uh, local utilities, water and sewer. And uh, just an example, working with a water district, they added something that will cost an, an additional $25,000. So we, need, we will have to pass that along. Um, there's, as I mentioned, the commute time is, the average is about 40 minutes. Um, there's a, a, a need for greater public transportation and connecting people to job centers. There was a mention before too about the lack of, um, or that we need more advocacy. And I fully agree. Uh, Commissioner Steed and I, as well as uh, Council Member Schwenk and uh, Executive Director Randy Joel, were up in Sacramento last week with our, our CEO, Tammy Marine, and we were advocating for, the, uh, for Cal Home to be um, refunded or funded again within the governor's budget. The governor proposed to eliminate $152 million for Cal Home, which is the only source of funding for ownership units in the state, and he proposed to completely eliminate it. All of the other funding out there goes towards rentals, which is necessary, but we don't have the funding for ownership units uh, that we need. And with that, I will conclude, but I'm available for any questions that you may have, and thank you again for bringing this topic up. Is that the only Okay. Okay. So that was the only speaker. So okay. um, great discussion. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to summarize some of the things that I heard. And then what we'll be doing is at your next meeting. I think I'll have um, some other agenda items as well. But this will be coming back at your next meeting as an agenda item as well. And what we're gonna try to do is group these comments into buckets. Um, you know, we there's a lot of overlap here. And um, so, so maybe we can group these things into um, buckets and then try and see um, what um, providers are out there in our community now. And then at the following meeting, we can start to, to, uh, to understand um, 
the, the gaps between the providers and the specific um, uh, needs. So when I say buckets, I mean, for example, education came up several times, right? So it was education by way of financial literacy, education by creditworthiness, education by um, uh, maybe education for parents on how to create generational wealth. So education was a big bucket that kept coming up over and over. So we want to kind of create that as a main bucket and then maybe delve into what are the sub areas there that we need to need to address. Um, so uh, generational wealth, generational gaps um, came up. So generational gaps in is there a desire for home ownership and to what level does that desire exist and what specifically does it exist for? Um, do the next, does the next generation specifically want home ownership um, in a traditional single family home or would they prefer something else? Um, so kind of trying to, to get to that space. Um, uh, the, the processes, that was another um, how to make sure you um, can, um, how to become a homeowner and what it means to be a homeowner. So those, those things around processes, um, what does it actually take to be a homeowner? Um, looking at grants and savings and usage of credit cards and other banking functions. Um, employment, that was another bucket. Um, a lot of do we have um, uh, jobs in the community that actually pay um, a, a comparable wage to what our housing is in this community, whether it's rental housing, whether it's home, you know, all of that is, is relevant. Um, the diversity of the types of homes that are available. Um, career pathways can also fall under in that bucket of um, wages and local businesses. Um, I, I, just because I, I, I like the saying, I did put more math, more money, just so you know in my notes. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, and then um, curriculum. Um, so student success, curriculum, are we really just checking the boxes to make sure they pass their standardized testing? Or are we like working in partnership with the school district to make sure they have long-term success as um, homeowners here in Temecula? Um, and then, um, again, costs, cost for education, cost for student loans. Um, subsets, um, that could actually be a separate bucket because somebody identified two subsets that have access to housing now. What are other types of subsets that we could be looking at that could be tied to specific programming? We talked about foster youth. They have this resource. But are there other, are there first generation students? Are there maybe students that, whose parents make under a certain level? Is there opportunity to d identify for their subsets and then advocate for funding for those specific subsets in, in additional, you know, it's, 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 that's, that's another thing that we can, we can go ahead and look at. Um, and then advocacy, I mean, that, that we're always advocating. Um, there's, we advocate, we have our own state lobbyists, we have our own federal lobbyists, we have, we're a member of the League of California Cities, um, we're a member of the National League of Cities, like we are always, the council members are advocating um, collectively and separately for housing resources and funding. Um, staff is absolutely, whether it is through the legislative office um, or whether it is community development through the planning association, we are always actively advocating for not only funding, but for, um, for, stream, for, for streamlining processes in a way that continue to keep the character of our community. Um, and some of the desires of our community. So um, that's, that's always um, challenging. So we have a ton of things here. Um, we heard you all, we'll go back and we'll listen um, one more time to, to, to your comments. And then at the next meeting, we will bring back a few buckets um, of items, some consolidated, and then seeing what we could, we could do. Um, Commissioner Eventoff, I, I can read your face. Um, and I can see you might want to ask some clarifying questions. On the advocacy, how's it going? So in some cases, good. In some cases, not so good, right? Um, where it is going good is um, we, um, in the past, the funding for housing has been eliminated. And we have advocated 
and we have had funding restored. Uh, maybe it's not to the level that we want it to be restored, but it has been restored. Um, in some situations, um, mind you, we have 482 cities in the state of California, and so advocacy is gonna be a challenge because diversity of community um, is gonna overlay on general, general needs. Um, we do have things that are done to us, things like SB9. That's a, that's a, that's a great example of this, something that was done to us. Yeah. But there are many pieces of legislation that nobody talks about anymore because we were able to stop them. And so advocacy, remember, is not only about the funding that we get and um, you know, the bills that we're able to pass. Advocacy is 150% about the things that we are able to stop. So from that perspective, I feel like we're, we're doing decent. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I'm, I mean, using, using um, education language, I feel like we're getting a degree, we're probably getting a C, and we know Cs get degrees, and so <laughs> that's probably where we're at in the advocacy space. There are some 3,000 to 3,500 pieces of legislation that are proposed during a legislative year, and so, the fact that the city or other groups are able to block a lot of this stuff that really rests local control, such as SB9, away from the city where we don't have control over our own city's destiny is, is, is fantastic that you guys are able to do that. Um, one would argue that really, as a region, as a region, a two-county region, um, we really need to figure out a way to coordinate our efforts. I mean, there are there is the League of Cities, there's CSAC, there's a variety of organizations that do all this. I understand that, um, but it's it's about time that the Inland Empire, which is bigger than the state of Oregon, physically and population-wise, um, bandies together for all this because we keep getting things done to us. We're not allowed to build another lane on the freeway unless it's an auxiliary lane or it's a toll lane because the coastal communities don't want that anymore. They want trains. We don't need trains out here. We, well, it'd be nice to have trains out here, but um, what we need are lanes. But the state is against that. And I use transportation as an, a salient example. Um, and so to have a greater voice, we truly, truly need to have an uh, Inland Empire Caucus not only of our legislators, but of our community groups, our chambers, our Southwest Ledge Councils and various other Ledge Councils get together and really press, press like we've never had before. So that's what I meant by advocacy. Understood. I know you guys do a great job and you're up there all the time. Understood. But you're all by yourself. Um, I've, I've noted coordination on housing efforts for the youth from a regional perspective. I've got something. So uh, you're striking all these conversations, and you're, you're as you start to, um, to put our items in the bucket, it helps to certainly clarify. But obviously, we're not the only ones who should be having this conversation, and certainly TVUSD is not the only educational um, facility uh, or place here. So the question that I have is then, I'm curious to know if we can reach out to MSJC and San Marcos in terms of what are they doing? How are they, do they have informational programs? How are they educating our, our young people? And if not, then, then how can we certainly partner with them in order to, to figure out and create that platform at a stage when um, it is critical? Obviously, uh, it's it's not enough to say that you've identified your major, right? That you, you you think you know what you're gonna do. I don't know how many people we know change their major throughout, you know, their college uh, career. Um, but we have to know more about how you're gonna sustain yourself. In and I quote Mr. Faulkner, this thing called life, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I think that's important as well. Um, and if we have current uh, in-community vocational partnerships, or if we know of those um, uh, places who are offering that locally, and not everyone does, whether that looks like, do we have somewhere who offers um, um, training and education in plumbing? Is that local here? Is that you know something in, in automotive or engineering? What, what do we have here locally to sustain? Um, and, and, and see what those partnerships look like. I think that's a good place as well to start to identify um, if they can be, be able to afford a home in our community currently. 
Commissioner Steed had a couple of comments. Yeah, real quick, just to get back to the legislative um, advocacy. Um, this, we did travel up, Habitat traveled up with um, two of our city members here to um, advocate on behalf of our region. Um, and that collaboration, I think, just really opened everybody's eyes, having those discussions as a city entity and as a nonprofit that builds houses and does it really well, and as a city that knows all the hoops that they have to go through to get houses for their citizens. Um, so that collaboration, um, I think we're, we're definitely going to continue it, Habitat and the city moving forward, and there's a lot of conversations that came from that, not only here regionally, but here nationally and within the state, that it's going to change um, a lot of the ways Habitat views things because of that um, panel that we had. But I encourage um, other entities also to continue to have that collaboration because I think when people get together, they um, accomplish a lot more when they work together. And especially when you have um, organizations that have huge credibility and they've already proven themselves and shown that it can be done, but together we can do it all better. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Oh. Yes, I just wanted to say ditto to that because I know um, being on the leadership for uh, the California Association of Realtors, we go to Sacramento every May and we meet with our legislative and we sit there and we tell them what we need in our region and hopefully they'll vote in that direction. But I think it, it means um, working together with other groups and I say maybe put together, have a meeting with some of the leaders um, in the Southwest Riverside County area because we are region 14 for real estate and we have I would like to say a little influence that we like to think we have when we go to Sacramento and we march to the Capitol and we go and sit down with a lot of our legislative. So maybe that's something that we can look into and let them know how strongly we feel in our region 14 in Southwest Riverside County and what we need. Okay. Commissioners, thanks for all those comments and we're gonna to continue to have a discussion uh, even after today. So. Hope that was a, a, a lot of information for you to, to yeah, try to put together. Yeah, it's, so, it's uh, you know, um, I, we are very grateful to Council Member Alexander who narrowed this scope for us. Um, her heart was absolutely in the space of next generation and youth um, and home ownership because this topic of housing, as Commissioner Evan Toff alluded to, is um, very, very big. And we are going to try to focus the commission and our work as staff specifically on um, the next generation and youth and home ownership um, and um, come on back in next month and keep uh, having this conversation. Thanks, Director, and, uh, and, and for commissioners. Uh, let us do our homework and be prepared to you know, dig into this and bring some more resources back at the next meeting as we continue these discussions as well. Uh, so. Is that it on that uh, business item? Uh, thank you so much. At this point in time, we're gonna go into uh, commissioner comments. Please stay around. We, we wanna mingle with you after this, so don't leave, please. All right, so we're gonna go into commissioner comments. Uh, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Evan Toff. God, haven't I talked enough? Um, all right, um, been wandering around the uh, Inland Empire uh, at a variety of organizations. I won't list them all, but I do wanna highlight a couple of things. One. I um, wanted to uh, congratulate the County Workforce Development Board. They not only met all their goals for 2023, but actually exceeded them as far as um, the, the number of people that they've placed, the education levels, the earnings that the folks that they placed, all these metrics, they actually exceeded every single one of them. Um, another one is that um, we have a Chinese New Year coming up, February 10th, this Saturday, I believe. And to celebrate that, uh, the, the celebrations are gonna continue all month long, culminating in, and I wanna invite the Ready Commission board members, by all means, to please attend the Lantern Festival 2024 on February 24th and 25th. Um, too big of a holiday just to contain in just one day. And it's from 10 to 4 p.m. Um, at the mall. So um, please, everybody's, um, uh, I believe admission is free and come see lion dancing and fantastic uh, uh, traditional wear and all that. A couple years ago was at the mall, unbelievable, you gotta see it. And um, I'll keep it uh, down to that. Oh, congratulations to the Animal Friends of the Valley on the opening of their new uh, clinic up there. That was a big deal and um, I'll just stop there. All right, thank, <laughs> you so, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
Of course, Rock Your Red for Heart and Stroke Awareness is on February the 23rd at Pachanga. Um, you guys should come out and support. We have Dr. Ho as well as the cardiac care team from Temecula Valley Hospital speaking. Um, and then to um, about the book cast. Um, actually, I've been reading that book. I think it was on Oprah Winfrey's um, book club or something like that. And I think that's something that we should maybe think about doing a, a book club and just maybe a book a quarter, and that we can come here or meet somewhere at a coffee shop, and let's just discuss, because you don't know what you don't know. And I think it's all part of educating so that we can um, basically put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see how they think. And that's how we learn to just love from, uh, from afar and from up close, because we can identify with each other. So I like that book. I've been reading it, too. So you and I need to chat about the book, and um, we can exchange some notes on how we um, feel about all this. Um, another thing is the Special Olympics is coming up. I think we got an email last week. It's going to be at Great Oaks High School, I think, Commissioner Faulkner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mar March 16th. So I've signed up. So I just think you guys should go online and look. It's a great opportunity to get back to our community, to our special needs kids, um, and just be involved with that. And then um, I want to be involved with that um, potluck at Great Oaks High School, as well as the diversity showcase. I cannot, I need more information on that because I want to be there for that. I think the Ready Commission should be there. I'm not going to sing or dance or anything, but I do want to support. And then the last thing that I had was I just wanted to share this and um, really short. You know, we talk about first, we talk about black history. I just wanted you to know that in 1940, Hattie McDow McDaniel is the first black actor to win the Oscar, and that was for her leading role in as Mammy in Gone with the Wind, and you guys may have remembered that movie. And then I have to share this last fact that in 1948, Gordon Parks is hired as the first black staff photographer at Life Magazine. You guys remember Life Magazine. That's an old school one. And then this is the last one for real. 1953, did you know that the designer Ann Lowe's is her name? She designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of good um, black history fact. And uh, with this being it's Black History 365 is what I like to call it. But it's also good just to be educating yourself on what really happened in black history because there's a lot of firsts in black history. And that completes my report. Mr. Steed. Great, thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, it is our honor as a ready commission to um, put together this Black History Proclamation every year. Um, Genesis, thank you for being here again. You not only sing that, but you feel it. And I can, I, like, I just watch your mouth and I, every syllable, like everything, you feel it down to your soul. So thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. And it wouldn't be the same without you, so you have to come every year. It's just the way it is. Yeah. So thank you for that. This is cute. Um, I want to thank our educators for being here. You put in a long day all day at school um, and you deal with these kids because we know what that's like. But we appreciate you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being there for your students and our community members that are also here. I think it's phenomenal. Um, we have a great community. We're so fortunate to have it, and we're so fortunate to have um, the panel here that we have mm -hmm. um, and the city that allows us to do it. So we appreciate that. Um, I did go see Black and White in Black and White at the Temecula Valley Museum. Awesome. They are phenomenal go pictures. They will move you. Go they will take you it. back in time. Um, it's just artistry at its finest, and so it's just a really, really great experience. And then also the Sunset Market is coming back on February 14th here at the City um, Promenade. So I encourage you to check that out. It's lots of fun, and it's a great way for our community to come together. And that is it for me. Thank you, Commissioner thank Steve. You. Vice Chair. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I want to use my time tonight, first of all, to thank every single one of um, our students um, and our youth who came out tonight. Um, you have no idea the impact that you have on us. That is truly the biggest thing. We can, we can stand here or sit here and we can talk and, and um, we can honor our, our past, certainly as we celebrate Black History Month, but it is through your eyes and through your voices 
and through your words that um, we are truly able to understand black history today. And that's something that I think is really, really valuable and important. So I continue to um, encourage each of you to use your voice, to speak and feel what, um, what is on your heart and what is on your mind so that you can create the change that you want to see. That is so incredibly important. Um, those of you um, who know me and get to see me all the time and every day know that I will always talk about the opportunity. These are hard conversations to have. They are incredibly difficult sometimes. Um, and sometimes there's strife even within the black community as I have um, come to learn and find out and, and working very closely with our black student union um, and our um, black student population. Uh, as well, and you know, as I have always said, and you know this, um, even where there might be strife and even where there might be challenges, everything is not necessarily as it seems. This is an opportunity, and you have to see the opportunity. The opportunity is to educate, to provide awareness, to let people know um, about the history, about the future, and what that's gonna look like and how, um, our, everything that we do is going to work towards shaping that. Um, you know, I, I, Commissioner Faulkner and I, Chair Faulkner and I talk a lot about um, unity and that is incredibly important. And so um, while we recognize certainly uh, and celebrate uh, our, our black history, it is about coming together, not only for this month of February, but always and always seeing um, our past because it is from our past that, that um, we're able to continue to rise and celebrate. So I applaud every single one of you for doing what it is that you do on your campuses, um, but also bringing it here tonight so that we can celebrate with you um, and let us, let us know. Uh, you are all, colleagues of mine on the Ready Commission, you are all invited as um, uh, Commissioner Wilson mentioned diversity showcase, certainly um, potlucks are good food. Um, all of those pieces that are um, wonderful celebrations and I think as you, they come up in every one of our campuses, um, please reach out to all of us. We want to go. Um, we miss karaoke and Genesis, let me tell you, <laughs> Jeff Faulkner would have sang. So, um, and so you, you, you missed an opportunity there, but don't worry, you let him know the next one and he'll be there, So uh, as we all will. So let, it, let us know we want to be there for all of the things, all of, all of the things, not just related to black history, but every opportunity that we get to celebrate diversity in this incredible community that we call Temecula. And so um, um, with that, I will just say that it is my honor and privilege to um, not only work alongside the youth in TVUSD, but also to lift you all up um, as best as I know how. And that might not always be perfect, but know that you can always count on me to do it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll close this out. <clears throat> had a chance to go to the library and uh, spend some time there uh, at the Black History Display where they have the books out front. They normally do it for most of the culture days. And guess what? Picked up me a book. It's called Illustrated, Honoring the Iconic and the Unseen Black History, George McCallman. I'm touching this book and I'm not falling out or passing out. It's, a, it's about history, guys. I'm like, so it's okay, it's okay, all right? So again, we, uh, did, I just wanna applaud the uh, library for making sure they recognize our months, make sure they show, display the books out there so we can learn about one another. I think as we learn about uh, one another, we tear down barriers, we tear down walls, uh, so again, if you haven't been over to the library, take the time to go over there, uh, check out a book, and learn a little bit about black history. Um, so I do this every, every month when we have a culture day. I go and learn about that culture. I want to I wanna understand what, the, what they've been through, what they come from. Um, um, I just love doing it because I was in the military. I led thousands of sailors and, and Marines. Uh, they came from all walks of life, every color, every tapestry that you can see in a crown box. Uh, so I led them, I, I, I've associated with them, I learned from them. So it is about unity and uniting things. I understand as a black man that most people won't understand uh, from my lens uh, what I've been through to get to where I'm at now. Got it.
got it, got it, got it. And I, I, and, and I get set back when people try to discredit uh, when I tell them that this happened to me and this night. But I never allowed it to keep me from, from pressing forward. As, there's only, I, I don't fear man. I mean, I, I fear God. So uh, any up, obstacle other than that is, is always movable. That's what I tell you. So, uh, so continue to step out. Continue to, to walk in, in pride in who you are. I mean, there's no, I can't change this skin. This is what God gave me. I live in it and I live high and I walk proud in it. Uh, so as we celebrate Black History Month, uh, continue to, to, do, to do that. I'm leaving here actually and going to the Frogs tonight, uh, the uh, play that they're putting on. So I'll be going over and checking that out tonight as well. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be amazing. Uh, so I'll leave you with a quote before we close out before I go to director's uh, uh, reports. The ultimate, Martin Luther King Jr. says, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he, and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna replace, where he or she stands at times of challenge and controversy. So an amazing quote uh, from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, one of the greatest Americans uh, in our country's history. So with that being said, Director, you got it for the report. No further comments. Oh, that was quick. I'm like, okay, all right. Okay. All right. And with that being said, we're going to adjourn the Ready Commission to our next scheduled meeting. The meeting is adjourned.